Canto 14 of the Purgatorio, uh, translated by John Ciardi. The Reign of Envy. Who do you think that is? He roams our hill before death gives him wings, and he's left free to shut his eyes or open them at will. I don't know, but I know he's not alone. Ask him, you're nearer. But put in a way that won't offend him. Take a careful tone. Thus, on my right, and leaning head to head, two of those spirits were discussing me. Then they turned up their faces, and one said, O soul that, though locked fast within the flesh, still makes its way toward heaven's blessedness, in charity, give comfort to our wish. Tell us your name and city, for your climb fills us with awe at such a gift of grace, as has never been seen up to this time. And I, in Falterona, lies the source of a brook that grows and winds through Tuscany till a hundred miles will not contain its course. From its banks I bring this flesh. As for my name, to tell you who I am would serve no purpose. I have as yet won very little fame. And the first spirit. If I rightly weigh your words upon the balance of my mind, it is the honor you intend to say, and the other spirit to him. Why is he so careful to avoid the river's name? He speaks as men do when they refer to things too foul or fearful. To which the shade he had addressed replied, That I don't know, but it would be a mercy if even the name of such a valley died. From its source high in the great range that outsoars almost all the others, from whose chain Pelorus was cut away, to the point where it restores its, where, where it restores in endless soft surrender what the sun draws from the deep to fall again as rain, that every rill and river may flow on. Men run from virtue, as if from a foe or poisonous snake. Either the land is cursed, or long corrupted custom drives them so. And curse or custom so transform all men who live there in that miserable valley, one would believe they feed in Circe's pen. It sets its first weak course among, our, among sour swine, indecent beasts more fit to grub and grunt for acorns than to sit to bread and wine it finds next as it flows down and fills out a pack of curs their snarl worse than their bite and in contempt it turns aside its snout down down it flows as the dog grows fewer the wolves grow thicker on the widening banks of that accursed and godforsaken sewer it drops through darkened gorges then to find the foxes in their lairs so full of fraud, they fear no trap set by a mortal mind. I think it's talking about hell, like the inferno, the previous book. I'm not sure, though. I'm just thinking because it says that the foxes are at the bottom and they're full of fraud. And then the bottom layers of hell were all the people that had um, sinned by fraud. So, okay. Um, line 55. Nor will I, though this man hear what I say, hold back the prophecy revealed to me, for well may he recall it on his way. I see your grandson riding to the chase. He hunts the wolves that prowl by the fierce river. He has become the terror of that place. He sells their living flesh then, shame on shame. The old beast slaughters them himself for sport. Many will die, and with them his good name. He comes from that sad wood covered with gore and leaves it in such ruin a thousand years will not serve to restock its groves once more. Just as a man to whom bad chance announces a dreadful ill distorts his face from distorts his face in grief, no matter from what quarter the hurt pounces. Just so that shade who had half who had half turned his head better to listen showed his shock and pain when he had registered what the other said. So moved by one's words and the other's face, I longed to know their names. I asked them, therefore, phrasing my plea with prayers to win their grace. At which the spokesman of the two replied, You beg me of my good grace that I grant you what I have asked of you and been denied. But God has willed his favor to shine forth so greatly in you, I cannot be meager. Guido del Duca was my name on earth. The fires of envy raged so in my blood that I turned livid if I chanced to see another man rejoice in his own good. This seed I sowed, this sad straw I reap here. O oh, humankind, why do you set your hearts on what is forbidden you share?
This is Rainier, the honor and the pride of the house of the Calboli, of which no one inherited his merit when he died. Nor in that war-torn land whose boundary lines the sea and the Reno draw to the east and west, and north and south, the Po and the Apennines, is his, is his the only house that seems to be bred bare of those accomplishments and merits, which are the good and truth of chivalry. For the land has lost the good of hoe and plow, and poisonous thorns so choke it that long years of cultivation would scarce clear it now. Where is Maynardi? Have you lost the seed of Lizio? Traversario? Traversario? Di Carpigna? O oh, Revignol's changed to a bastard breed. When will Fabro evermore take root in all Bologna, or in Fainza, Fainza a Fosco? It was his little plant's most noble shoot. O oh, Tuscan, can I speak without a tear of Ugolino de Azzo and Guido de Prata, who shared our time on earth? If I'm not mistaken, those two were in hell. Ugolino. Which one is he? I don't remember. And Guido. I'm pretty sure those two are in hell. Okay. Um, oh, Tuscan, can I speak without a tear of Ugolino de Azzo and Guido de Prata, who shared our time on earth? And with them there, Federico di Tignozo and his train, the house of the Traversari and the Anastagi, both airless now. Or, dry-eyed, think again of knights and ladies, of the court and field that bonded us in love and courtesy, where now all hearts are savagely self-sealed. Oh, Bretonoro, why do you delay? Your lords and many more have fled your guilt. And why, like them, will you not melt away? Banya Caval does well to have no heirs, and Castro Caro badly, and Conio worse, in bothering to breed such counts as theirs. The, Pag the Pagani will do well enough, all told, when once their fiend is gone, but not so well their name will ever shine again as pure gold. O oh, Ugolin de Pontolini, your name remains secure, since you have none to bear, and in degeneracy bring it to shame. But leave me, Tuscan. I am more inclined to spell my grief in tears now than in words, for speaking thus has wrung my heart and mind. We knew those dear souls heard us go away. Their silence, therefore, served as our assurance that leaving them we had not gone astray. We had scarce left those spirits to their prayer when suddenly a voice that ripped like lightning struck at us with a cry that split the air. All men are my destroyers. It rolled past as thunder rolls away into the sky if the clouds burst to rain in the first blast. Our ears were scarcely settled from that burst when, lo, the second broke. With such a crash, it seemed the following thunder of the first. I am Alglaros, who is turned to stone. We're at... To cower in Virgil's arms, I took a step to my right instead of going on. The air had fallen still on every hand when Virgil said, That was the iron bit that ought to hold men hard to God's command. But still you gulped the hellbait hook, and all the old and all and the old adversary reels you in. Small good to you is either curb or call. I don't know what just happened. Is it saying that? I don't know what it's saying. Okay, whatever. Um, the heavens cry to you, and all around your stubborn souls wheel their external glory, and yet you keep your eyes fixed on the ground. I guess it's saying that God used to speak to people with lightning, and, um, and Dante's cowering in Virgil's arms instead of trying to listen to the lightning? I'm not sure. I mean, it's clearly not God who's speaking through the lightning in this case, so I don't know what's happening. Anyways, last two phrases. <laughs> and for each turning from the joys of love, the all-discerning flails you from above. 